debate, discussion and choice of governments, then clearly politicians will also be affected. And therefore, what you need today is a set of leaders who can read the writing on the wall, who can anticipate this movement and then take a leadership position, not purely as a matter of political convenience, also because they are deeply convinced that this is good for humanity and this is good for the societies that they themselves are responsible for. To be quite honest, I don't see too many leaders uh, on the horizon at this point of time who have that kind of vision and that kind of concern and care for the future. Working on environmental challenges will require an increasing degree of trust and or cooperation. Where do you see the role of major international organizations such as the UN and NATO in building this trust and cooperation? I really think they'll become increasingly important simply because these are issues that a country or a group of countries are not going to be able to solve. You really need a totally different global compact. You need global initiatives that are able to define these problems and are able to find multilateral solutions for them. Uh, so I would say uh, an organization like the UN probably needs to redefine its role and perhaps even restructure its organization. Uh, uh, the, the new Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, I must say, has picked up climate change as perhaps the most important part of his agenda. And uh, I'm very, uh, very, very grateful that he has taken up this position. And I admire the man for having the, the perception and uh, the sense of understanding uh, that this really could be the defining problem uh, of the 21st century. How do you balance the developing world's drive for development and the increasing stability that development can bring against the climate change effects caused by that development and the instability that climate change brings? You know, I really think we need to redefine the word development. Unfortunately, ever since the Industrial Revolution began and in some sense driven and inspired by the success of technology, modern math methods of manufacture which allowed you to produce more and more and consume more and more at lower prices, we've just got drunk with this feeling that development consists of consuming more and more, increasing your GDP despite the flaws in that measure. I think that needs to be redefined. The fact is, in the process of pursuing so-called development, we've imposed such a huge cost of a social nature of uh, damage and depletion of our natural resources and several other ills that have never been taken into account explicitly. Uh, it's only now, I must say, that uh, people are getting convinced about the reality of climate change, about the damage to our natural resources and the finite, finiteness of several resources on this earth, that perhaps we need to look at the very basics of development. Having said so, therefore, I think the developing countries need to do a lot of intellectual uh, work rather than blindly follow what the developed world has done. And that, of course, will not work by itself. The developed world also needs to think about how to reduce the excessive consumption of natural resources, of their footprint on the ecosystems of this earth. So what you really need is a totally new understanding of what should define human welfare and the benefit of the human race. And this would require a su substantial shift I'm not saying that we have to go back and start living in caves, but I think we have the technological and the economic muscle to be able to bring about a shift without any major discontinuities in the progress or what we define as progress uh, that's taking place. So do you think that security in the latter part of the 21st century will be less about personal wealth and more about a sustainable quality of life? Absolutely, and this also means that some of the huge disparities that we have currently both across societies and within societies will need to lessen. And I think we'll have to understand that 
that's an extremely important objective of development. Development that only allows a very small section of society to prosper and a large number of people to be left out of that whole system is clearly not development. It was Kenneth Boulding, an economist who I greatly admire, who said, and this was maybe a quarter century, more than a quarter century ago, he said that uh, it's unlikely that 200 years ago, the difference between the richest societies and the poorest was more than one is to five. And he says today it's more than one is to 50. So, you know, the trend that this world has been going on blindly without paying any attention to these issues, in my view, is suicidal. We have to stop this. How likely do you think it is that the effects of climate change could lead to a major armed conflict? Yes, I think one reason for such conflict could be competition for scarce resources. Uh, water is certainly one of them. It could be hydrocarbon resources. Um, there could be uh, problems of, let's say, decline in agricultural yields, which leads to uh, deprivation in terms of nutrition and food. Um, and a whole range of uh, catastrophes and natural disasters which would get exacerbated with uh, the impacts of climate change. Now, essentially all of this means that there is the danger of larger and larger numbers of people moving from wherever they are settled to other areas. And when you start seeing this kind of a trend, then clearly you have the inbuilt uh, elements of conflict. And I, I would imagine this is likely to grow to a large extent. For instance, in the IPCC synthesis report, we've estimated that by 2020, in Africa alone, there would be something like 75 to 250 million